The 2023 season is going to come with a lot of expectations for the Baltimore Orioles, but there's also some things you need to know because the O's aren't going to go all in this year. So today we talk about six things that Orioles fans need to realize about the 2023 season. That's coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, February 20th, 2023. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to take a look forward at some things that could happen and some things that you should be ready for in the 2023 season for the Baltimore Orioles, because this team should be competitive. This team could push for a playoff spot, but it's good to know that this team hasn't gone all in yet. I mean, if you look at what they did this offseason, they didn't spend money. They haven't gone all in. So there's some things that are going to be annoying to Orioles fans. Like there were things that really annoyed Orioles fans as the O's made the playoff push in 2022. So I'm not saying I agree with the thinking behind any of these things we're going to talk about today. But I listed off six things that Orioles fans maybe don't need to realize, but need to at least be prepared for as they get ready for the 2023 season. So let's jump right into it. Thing number one, this is something we've talked about on the podcast a little bit, but Grayson Rodriguez and D.L. Hall, while they'll both play a big role, I think, in the big leagues this year, they're both going to be limited in a couple different ways. Let's start with Grayson Rodriguez. Now, even as I say this, and I, I know they're going to be limited. I still do think Rodriguez is going to get an opening day spot in the starting rotation. I think he will most likely pitch either the fourth or fifth game of the year. He'll pitch in Texas back home. And the Orioles will try to line it up where he then maybe pitches again in that home opening series against the Yankees. Probably be a smart way to do it. But what I will say is, even if he is in the rotation from day one, which I think there's a really good chance of that happening at this point, he's still going to be limited. He has never thrown more than 103 innings in any season because he hasn't done it in the pros. And you basically can't do that in high school. And he never played college baseball. He was a high school draft pick for the Orioles in the first round in 2018. So in 2019, he threw 94 innings. Of course, minor league season canceled in 2020. 2021, he throws 103 innings, and last year, he was on pace to throw a lot more. He had thrown 75 and two-thirds innings before the injury, and the injury took him out, you know, just before July. He misses three months, comes back right at the end. I should say he hadn't thrown that much before the injury, but close to it. Made those couple starts at the end, ended up with 75 and two-thirds innings last year. So the Orioles were prepared to run him up towards 120, 130, you know, maybe push 140 innings last year. But because they didn't get to do it, I would think that number, 120, maybe around 130 innings, is probably the target for Grayson Rodriguez in 2023. Now, innings aren't always the best measure of limits on guys. It's more about pitch count. It's more about, you know, high-velocity pitches. It's more about pitches in key spots that are high leverage versus low leverage pitches. Those are all taken into account. It's not just innings. And Mike Elias has gone on the record talking about this offseason that Grayson Rodriguez is not going to have like a hard line innings limit because he said there's not enough data out there that says that that truly protects a pitcher from future arm injury. And of course, Rodriguez is coming off the lat injury, the, the back injury he had last year that kept him out three months. So the O's will be cautious for health reasons because of that. And with his arm, just because he is a pitcher and pitchers are prone to injury in Major League Baseball. But I do think with all those factors... Yeah, he may not get to more than like 130 innings. So even if he's in the opening day rotation, they're going to skip some starts. They're going to give him an extra one or two days of rest in between. He's going to early in the season be on a pitch count of maybe 70, 75, or, or at the most 80 pitches. He may not go more than five innings in the first couple months of his big league career. Heck, his first few starts may be like four innings, and then a guy like D.L. Hall or Austin Both or Tyler Wells follows him for length out of the bullpen. And that could be the plan just to limit those pitches and those innings. So he's going to be nasty. He's going to dominate at times. He's going to struggle at times because he is a rookie. 
And it's going to be fun when he pitches, but you're probably going to have to wait till 2024 to see him fully unleashed in an Orioles uniform. And that brings me to DL Hall because different than Rodriguez, Hall has already pitched in the big leagues, came up at the end of the last year, made the one start, few relief appearances. So he does have some big league innings. Now, just like Rodriguez, he's never thrown more than 103 innings through 94 and a third in 2018, 80 and two thirds in 2019, 31 and two thirds in 2021 when he had the elbow injury. And then he threw 98 innings last year when he was pretty much healthy in all of 2022, you know, between starting in Norfolk, then coming up and working out of the bullpen in Norfolk and then Baltimore to end the season, just shy of a hundred innings at 98. So again, I fully expect the Orioles to push him, especially if he's in a starting role past hundred innings this year. And for him to set a new high in innings pitched in a season at the professional level, but there's going to be some restrictions. Now he's had this little back issue, you know, the lumbar issue that came up three weeks ago. Now Hall did say at the end of last week in training camp that, that he is fine, that he's ready to go. The Orioles have talked about, you know, they're trying to somewhat stretch him out as a starter. All those things are making me a little hesitant to think that he's going to be on the opening day roster. I think he should be, but everything they talked about between that little injury and working him up as a starter makes me think he's going to start the year, even if he's healthy. In the Norfolk rotation, I'm, I'm starting to kind of move away from those opening day roster predictions like I did last week that had Hall making the opening day roster out of the bullpen. It could happen, but whether he's a starter or a reliever, they're going to limit how much he is used just because he's never thrown 100 pro innings. So even if D.L. Hall by June or even earlier has a rotation spot because he's just that good early in the season, they're going to do the same thing they're doing with Grayson. Skip a start. Give him an extra day or two off. Only throw him four or five innings at a time. So just be ready for that to happen. Second thing to be aware of in 2023 is that your favorite prospects, as has happened already, they're probably going to stay in AAA a little longer than you want. And I think for everyone but probably Taron Vavra, this has already happened to for the Orioles. Now, Vavra only had 173 plate appearances in AAA before the Orioles called him up to the big leagues last season in late July. Now, the thing with Vavra was, even though they called him up because they kind of needed a player like that in that roster spot when they made the move, it's not like he got put right into the lineup. Remember, he, he sat the first three games. His first appearance was as a pinch runner in the big leagues, and it took him a while to even really get into the lineup in like back-to-back -back days. He didn't do that for a while. And when it was all said and done, you know, Vavra didn't play all that much. I mean, he had 103 plate appearances in the big leagues, and he got called up, you know, basically right at the end of July. And we'll talk about this a little later, specifically with him, but... Even they slow played him in the big leagues. But speaking of AAA, I mean, Gunnar Henderson had 295 AAA plate appearances last year. Now, that's not a very large number. He was up there for half the year, and he came up on August 31st. But he was clearly ready for the big leagues before August 31st. Like, most of the murmurs started more like July 31st that Gunnar Henderson should be in the big leagues. He was there a little bit longer. Adley Rutschman, some of it has to do with the triceps injury early last year, but did have 238 AAA plate appearances. You could argue near the end of the 2021 season, Adley was definitely ready to be in the big leagues. The O's were obviously a terrible team, so you can see why they kept him down. But again, a little more than you wanted. Kyle Stowers ended up with 500 AAA plate appearances because he got a chunk of them in 2021. Then, of course, was in AAA the whole year last year until getting called up in August. He made the 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 one little stint in June in Toronto when Santander was unvaccinated, but called up for real in mid-August and, and had 500 on the dot plate appearances in AAA. That, that's a lot of time in AAA. And then Ryan Mountcastle kind of takes the cake. Mountcastle had 553 AAA plate appearances, and that's not even counting the 2020 season. Remember, Mountcastle made his debut in 2020 when there was no minor league season. So he was at the alternate site before the O's called him up. If that were a regular season, I mean, the O's waited about a month to call him up. That's another month of AAA plate appearances. I mean, you're looking at a guy who's, you know, pushing towards 700 AAA plate appearances before getting to the big leagues and becoming an impact hitter as soon as he got to the bigs. He should have been there really at, in 2019 at some point, and, and he just wasn't. So that's something to remember when you look at the next wave of prospects in AAA in terms of hitters. There are four guys right now who I think most people believe have 
has a real, real shot of getting to the big leagues in 2023. Joey Ortiz, Jordan Westberg, Connor Norby, and Colton Kowser. I don't think it's out of the question that any or all of those four could be playing in an Orioles uniform this season. But when you look through the plate appearances, Joey Ortiz just 159 at AAA, Colton Kowser just 124, and Connor Norby just 42, you know, just came up for the last two weeks of the AAA season last year after dominating AA. They're all going to start the year in Norfolk because – Mike Elias has shown he wants players to, you know, get near that 300 plate appearance threshold in AAA before he considers bringing them up. So you're going to need to see Ortiz and Kowser and Norby for a couple months in AAA before they come up. Now, Westberg's a little different because he was in AAA most of the year last year, and he's already amassed 413 plate appearances in Norfolk. That's way more than Henderson and Rutschman and Vavra had and, and pretty close to what Mountcastle and Stowers had before they got called up. So he would have the strongest case to come up early in the year or even be on the opening day roster if there was an injury. But you got to remember, he's not on the 40-man roster. Joey Ortiz is the only of the four that's already on the 40-man. So the O's would have to clear a 40-man spot to get him on there. And they're not going to rush to do that when they, they have infielders on the roster already. So just be prepared that it's going to be May 1st and you're going to be calling for Joey Ortiz or Colton Kowser or Jordan Westberg. And they're just... They're not going to come up at that point because kind of how the Orioles are operating right now. But I still think there's there's four more things we need to talk about for this upcoming season. And coming up after this break, we'll talk about some of the veterans the O's have brought in, how much they will play. And then I've mentioned Kyle Stowers and Taryn Vavra. We'll talk about them specifically, but that's coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. We just finished with the NBA All-Star break. The midpoint of the season is here. And now's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet, up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, it's secure, and it's super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to threes drained. And if you get on that FanDuel app and you're looking for some NBA bets and you're thinking, oh, you know, who should I uh, maybe do some points, rebounds, and assists? Well, as LeBron James tries to drag the Lakers to the playoffs, maybe you get on LeBron and hit the over on those prop bets. And FanDuel, they even let you combine your bets for a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports partner, betting partner of the NBA. So we're talking six things that Orioles fans need to maybe come to grips with, maybe realize, maybe just be prepared for. In 2023. And the next one is something we've already touched on a little bit, but it comes to Kyle Stowers and Taryn Favro because these two guys got called up in the second half of the season last year. And well, I don't think Orioles fans across the board were very happy with how much Vavra and Stowers ended up playing down the stretch. Taryn Vavra came up in July, was on the roster for 63 games and only got 103 plate appearances. That is less than two plate appearances per game. He was not at all a starter. Kyle Stowers was on the roster for 48 games and only got 98 plate appearances and basically right at two plate appearances per game that he's on the roster. So both of them were basically playing half the time and Ern Vavra's case, even less than half the time that they were on the big league roster. And some were upset because both were ranked prospects. Both definitely showed some flashes of, of some good hitting when they were in the big leagues. And obviously both hit really well in AAA, which is why they got called up. But when you look at it, I think you have to know that it's going to somewhat happen again. Kyle Sowers and Taryn Vavra, I don't think they're going to be playing every day, especially early in this season. Do I think they're both going to make the roster for on opening day? Yeah, I do. I've, I've put it in both my projections that they'll make the roster. I think most people agree. But when I do those projections, I, I never put them in the locks. I always say, you know, they're most likely going to make it, but they are not locks for the roster because they're in somewhat roster battles with guys. And I think they'll make the team. But you look at the infield, for example, it's Ramon Arias and Adam Frazier, both second base options, both better defenders and have a longer track record of a big league hitter than 
Taryn Vavra does. And now Vavra can play a little corner outfield as well. But you got guys like Hayes and McKenna out there behind Mullins and, and Santander. And you still have Stowers, who we're talking about as well. You know, could Stowers be in some sort of platoon with Austin Hayes in left field? I could see that happening. Could he play a little more right field because Santander will DH more this season? Yeah, I could see that as well. And I do see across the board Stowers probably playing more than Taryn Vavra does. But I don't think either of them, especially for the first half of the year, is going to be an everyday player for the Orioles because you're going to have guys ahead of them like Arias and, and Adam Frazier, the was signed to a major league deal and, and committed $8 million to, which is a lot for this Michael Elias era so far in free agency. They're going to play those guys. And that's what we're getting to next because Stowers and Vavra, you just got to be ready for, they're going to help the team, but I just don't see a way for them to get in there every day unless Hayes is just really, really bad and Stowers takes over in the outfield. And that takes me to the fourth thing that O's will need to know for this season is that the veterans that the O's brought in, they're going to play a lot and people might not like it. I mean, it happened with Rugnet Odor last year, just playing over guys like Vavra, especially after Vavra came up and people were upset. Obviously Robinson Trinos, even playing at all, had people upset for different reasons, but the guys they brought in are going to be used. I mean, starting with Michael Gibbons, who I don't think will upset as many people that he pitches a lot. Now that we have Dylan Tate out for at least a month with an injury, Felix Bautista and DL Hall questionable for opening day, along with Nick Vespi, Givens could be used in some really high leverage spots. But I think people expect that when you go get a big league reliever who has been good in the past for the Orioles in his first stint. But then you go to Adam Frazier. The O's are not signing an Adam Frazier type player for one year, $8 million, especially when they're not giving out basically any free agent contracts. If they don't expect to play Frazier a lot. And he's not only going to play second, he's going to play some corner outfield on this team as well to get him in the lineup. Now, I don't think he'll play against lefties too often. I think you'll have, you know, the Ramona Rias's and the, and the Ryan McKenna's and the Austin Hayes of the world in there against the left-handers. But if there's a right-hander on the hill for the opposing team, at least for the first half of the season, I mean, you can expect Adam Frazier to probably be hitting eighth or ninth in the Orioles order pretty much every time, whether he's at second or left field or in right field defensively for the Orioles. And I get his season wasn't great in Seattle last year, just an 82 WRC plus, but he's a veteran who's hit really well at times in his career was great in Pittsburgh you know, before he got traded to San Diego and then ended up in Seattle. And he's a guy who you can at least trust to be a little steady when you still have questions about guys like Arias and, and Vavra. So Frazier's going to play similar to the way that Odor played last year. Cause Brandon Hyde trusted his veterans in a playoff race. Frazier's going to play now. It could happen where his bat is just terrible. And if that happens, then yeah, he he probably will not play as much. You'll see more Vavro. You'll see more Arias. Maybe you'll even see uh, some sort of DFA and, and get Jordan Westberg or Joey Ortiz to the big leagues if it's that bad. But as long as his bat is okay, just a touch better than last year, and his defense is still good at either second base or the corner outfield, Frazier is going to play. As we've seen from John Angelos not wanting to spend any money, if he's actually letting Mike Elias spend $8 million on a major league player, he's going to play a lot this year, and you have to be ready for that. And the same thing with a guy like Kyle Gibson. If he's letting Mike Elias spend $10 million for a major league starting pitcher in Kyle Gibson, he's going to start every fifth day. Now, he's coming in to take the Jordan Lyles role, and I think Lyles did a great job as the veteran innings eater for the staff last year. And Gibson's going to be the veteran innings eater for the staff this year. But if things get a little rocky early, you know, Gibson had some rocky stretches with the Phillies last year, and he's had some throughout his career. You know, he's never really been an ace on the mound. He's just a solid depth pitcher. When he has those rocky stretches, he's still going to throw every fifth day and eat innings for the Orioles because him and, and now Cole Irvin after the trade as well are the two, like, somewhat established veteran pitchers. And even Irvin's only had two full big league seasons. I mean, Gibson has been up for 10 years. So if Irvin struggles, he could be moved into a different role. Gibson's going to stay in that role unless things become a nightmare. I mean, it would have to take his ERA like ballooning up over six and it would have to be, you know, after a couple months of the season that that's happening for the Orioles to even make a change. And I still don't think they'd like DFA him or release him. They'd probably just move him to the bullpen and see if he can find it and, and try to place him back in the rotation again. So just be ready for that, because if they're handing out the biggest contract in the history of Michael Elias being the GM here, one year, $10 million for Kyle Gibson, the plan is for him to make 32, 33, 34 starts with the Orioles this year, pitch every five days and be the, the veteran leader and the innings eater for this rotation. 
And as long as he can, I mean, as sad as it is to say, if he can keep the ERA below five and a half, he's going to be out there just to at least eat some innings. And maybe his role will lessen if he's bad in the second half and they'll give more of the young guys a chance. I think they will because they've, as Elias has talked about, they have 12 starting pitching options heading into spring training. But as long as he's at least giving okay innings, I mean, he's going to be out there every time. And and James McCann's going to play as well. The other you know, veteran that they acquired, traded for from the Mets to be the backup catcher. And not only is he going to be the backup catcher and he's going to start behind the plate at least once a week. And, and sometimes he's going to play twice a week as the starting catcher. Just be ready for that. Now, Adley will DH and play a little first base, but McCann's going to be back there because he gives you a better bat and way better defense than Robinson Trinos gave you last year. But McCann could also DH a little bit. I mean, he has good numbers in his career against left-handed pitchers. So if you see a lefty out there one day, Adley might be catching and James McCann might be DHing or flip-flop. They might let James McCann, you know, catch on a Wednesday night against a lefty and give Adley like a half day off and just put him in as the designated hitter. It's going to happen. So just be ready for it. And that's what we're going to talk about a little more coming up next for our final two things that O's fans will need to realize this season. Adley Rushman will not and cannot play every day. I'm going to get into this one coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Built Bar, a delicious treat, but without all the fat and calories. You have to try Built Bar if maybe eating a little better is, is part of one of your New Year's resolutions. Because with Built Bar, it's a protein bar. It's got Everything a protein bar has, it's good for you. It's only 130 calories. It's only four grams of sugar. It's a whopping 17 grams of protein, but they're delicious. I had never found a protein bar that tastes good until Built Bars. They literally taste like candy bars. They're all covered in 100% real chocolate. They've got amazing flavors like churro, like peanut butter brownie, coconut almond. But here's what's even better now with Built Bars. You don't have to go to built.com and order your bars and wait for them to come in the mail. You can still do that, but now you could walk into your local Walmart, walk into your local Sam's Club, and you can walk out with a box of built bars. That's right. They're in the stores now at Walmart or Sam's Club. So head over there or head to built.com and get your hands on some delicious and nutritious built bars. So for the final two things that Orioles fans need to realize for the 2023 season, we start with Adley Rutschman. I just mentioned him and his playing time when talking about that. Yeah, James McCann is, is probably going to be in there once and and potentially twice a week for the Orioles, whether he's catching or doing a little DHing against left-handed pitchers. Adley Rutschman, again, he cannot and he will not play every day. Every bullet point I've hit on so far, Rodriguez and, and Hall being limited, there's an easy argument to be made the other way that, there's no science about limiting innings, helping pitchers' arms. So let them loose. They're maybe the best two pitchers on the staff. Prospects staying in AAA. Well, if you're not going to spend on big leaguers, you might as well just call everybody up. Totally get that. The veterans playing a lot. If Gibson's struggling early, if Frazier's struggling early, get them out of there. You got depth options. Totally get that. Stowers and Vavra not playing every day. Hey, if they're in the big leagues and they're prospects for you, let's see what they got. You know what? Get that. Play them. But the thing that irks me and I don't understand is people getting upset that Adley Rutschman is not in the lineup every single day. Do you know what the catcher position entails on your body? The reason why catchers, except for the elite Hall of Famers like Yadier Molina, don't have incredibly long careers is because they play a lot and it just takes a toll on their bodies. The reason catchers generally aren't great hitters, not just in MLB history, but right now too across the board generally, is that it takes so much out of you just to catch defensively that it's tough to get up there and hit well. You know, the great ones did it, like Buster Posey. Yadier Molina did it for a while, but I mean, Yadier Molina was still catching the last couple of years. He was a horrendous hitter the last few seasons for the Cardinals. That's kind of why he's retired at this point. Adley can't play every day. If you play him every day now, yeah, maybe he can get through it. He's 25. He could do it. He's an elite athlete. But by 30, he's going to be done. He's going to be a first baseman or a DH. Not going to give you any value behind the play. That's where a lot of value is for him. He's an elite defensive catcher along with being an elite hitter. That's what makes Adley Rutschman so good. So you got to give him a break back there. Take it from me. I didn't play baseball at a high level, but playing travel ball as a catcher for 10 years, I was playing little kid ball with the knee savers on. And it takes a toll on your body. I can feel it now. 
Can't imagine what a major league catcher has been catching since they were eight years old feels. You got to give him days off. And listen, he might get two days off per week at times from catching. But one of those days, he's going to DH and he's going to be in the lineup. And the other day, he's going to sit and that's okay because him sitting early in the year is going to help in September. It's going to help in October and it's going to help in 2024, 25, 26, and more likely 2031 and 32 and 33. Hopefully, he's still in an Orioles uniform at that point. Catchers don't play every day. The only catcher right now that I truly still believe is better than Adley Rushman. I think Adley is the number two catcher in baseball right now. Number one is JT Romuto. Not only is he the best catcher in baseball, he's pretty much right at the top in terms of how often he plays. He's the best catcher in baseball, great hitter, great defender, and he plays more than any other catcher. And also, he has one of the weaker backups in the game, or at least he's had of the last few years with, with uh, you know, I believe they had, what, Garrett Stubbs back there and, and Andrew Knapp. Not great backups. So they were playing him every day, and, and he helped the Phillies do the World Series. So JT Romuto plays the most, and he's the best catcher. Romuto caught 79% of the Phillies' innings last season. Now, he did catch every inning in the postseason as the Phillies went all the way to Game 6 of the World Series. But they also had him ready to do that because he caught 79% of innings. And 79% of innings, basically right at the top of Major League Baseball. Adley Rutschman, despite the Orioles slow playing him last year and keeping him out of the lineup or out of catching a good amount before, you know, really the end of the year and, and right after calling him up, Adley still caught 73% of the Orioles' innings last year. 73%. Real Muto at 79%. And if you take the data from just July 1st on, remember, Adley gets called up last year, all right, in, in mid to late May. And they kind of did a ramp up with him. You know, he wasn't catching back-to-back -back days, definitely wasn't catching, you know, three straight days for a while. He was DHing a good amount, getting days off. They really didn't ramp him up fully until maybe right at the end of June. So we'll say from July 1st on. From July 1st on, Adley caught 77% of the Orioles' innings. Remember, Real Muto, league leader at 79%. And the best catcher in baseball, Adley, number two catcher, 77%. He's still playing more than most catchers. And he's right where he should be in playing time. I never understood people saying, oh, Adley doesn't play enough. They're sitting him too much. He's young. He's playing how every other catcher plays. You have to save the knees. I feel like I want to scream at some people who try to think that Adley needs to play every single day. It's going to hurt the O's at the end of this season, down the line in his career. He still gets to DH and get a half day off. And yeah, he's going to be out of the lineup completely at least once a week. It's usually going to be on Sundays because it's tougher on your body to catch a day game after a night game. Usually play Saturday night, Sunday at one. That's why he doesn't play in those games. They're not punt lineups. They're trying to win. He's not going to play every day. Just you got to understand that. It's for the health of him and for the Orioles moving forward. And it's the right decision because it's not like they're doing something that other teams aren't doing. Nobody's playing their catchers more than 80% of the time. Adley was at 77. He's above most other guys. He's right where the elite catchers are. There's nothing abnormal about what he did last season. And the sixth and final thing that O's fans need to realize this year is even if the O's are competing and in contention at the trade deadline, be ready for them to make another trade where they trade away a big leaguer from their team. And it could be a very similar trade to the Jorge Lopez deal last year where the O's traded him to Minnesota and got four minor league pitchers back from the Twins. Because the Orioles have a deep bullpen. And there's been murmurs about them trying to operate like the Rays do. And if you see what the Rays do every season, and they've been mostly competitive over the past decade... They still do trade away some big leaguers at the deadline to you know, clear 40-man space, clear a little money, revamp their prospect hall. So you look at this bullpen, and once it gets fully healthy, it's going to be stacked, and there's going to be some good relievers in AAA for the Orioles this year. So if we get to the deadline, now if the team flounders and is kind of out of it, then yeah, a guy like Michael Givens is going to be dealt, and they'll look to deal other guys, maybe Kyle Gibson, guys like that. But even if they're in it, they might trade Dylan Tate at the trade deadline because he's only a couple years away for free agency. They might still trade Michael Givens if he's not having an amazing year. They might trade a CNL Perez or a Joey Crable. It might happen. I don't like it, but it may happen again and, and just want to get you ready for it. But that I felt like was the six things that 
really need to be communicated to Orioles fans before this season. And, and it's not a, Hey, I told you so get this through your head. Cause even the philosophies between or, or behind most of these things, I don't even agree with, but I'm just letting you know with how the team has operated so far under Mike Elias and how they're going to continue to do so. These are more six things of get yourself ready for it and prepared for it because there's a good chance it could and, and, and will happen in 2023. But that'll do it for today's episode. Tomorrow, an exciting day. The first full squad workout in Sarasota for spring training. The hitters will be there as well. And coming up on tomorrow's episode, we're going to start our position preview series here on the podcast, previewing every position on the field for the Orioles heading into 2023. And tomorrow we start with the outfielders. Is that group of five set? And could Colton Kowser break in or any of you know the no more Mazzara types get on this roster at some point this season but that's all coming up on tomorrow's episode until then I'm Connor Newcomb and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network your team every day